Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on Wednesday, the 29th day of November, year of our Lord, 2017. Welcome to the John Moore Show. Prepper tip of the day. Uh, with the things I'm learning, and I'm sure the things you're learning as well, I want to encourage everybody to check your food and water supply. You keep as much water on hand as you can. It's going to vary from person to person as to what you can do. There, there are uh, large plastic containers, uh, flexible, that fit inside a bathtub, by the way, to fill up the bathtub and keep the water clean for drinking purposes. Uh, you might want to consider getting one of the high-quality water filters that Professor McCanny sells also. And food. I recommend, get this, I recommend a two-year supply of food. Uh, you want to have food on hand you normally eat and bulk grains. Bulk grains is the uh, least expensive, most efficient way to store up the most amount of food in the smallest amount of space uh, economically, uh, as opposed to freeze-dried food, which is great, but uh, a bit too expensive for most people. So the perfect tip of the day is make sure you got a, a two-year supply of food and, and water that will carry you at least a month minimum. Um, one one month supply of water if you don't have your own uh, source that you own and control. Okay, that said, we have, uh, as we do most Wednesdays, my friend Professor James McCanny. Professor McCanny is a credentialed astrophysicist. He's taught astrophysics at the university level at Cornell University. He taught mathematics, taught mathematics at Cornell University also. He's an accomplished author, having written 10 books and more on the way. Amateur archaeologist, radio talk show host. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, John. Good day Excellent. today. It is. Excellent audio. The um, the heads continue to roll in terms of um, high-profile media uh, and politicians being fired. This morning, the big news is Matt Lauer has been yep. fired from the network uh, for uh, alleged sexual misconduct. And I say alleged because in, unless there's been a, a conviction or a finding in court, they are just allegations, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I don't, it's, it's, it seems like this whole uh, matter has taken on a life of its own with people, uh, women coming forward to make these allegations, uh, men's careers are being damaged or destroyed. And um, it, it looks like it's uh, become quite a, uh, quite a media event, hasn't it, Jim? Uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, I'm I'm not sure what exactly to say, but um, it, w whenever I see something like this, yeah, you know, like you say, what's going on? What's really going on? Uh, and it's hmm, I don't I don't know. I have no idea. But the the entertainment industry is ripe with that, of course. The other question is. Uh, uh, in fact, Hollywood makes a lot of uh, mileage off of that, off of the stories and the, the personal ups and <clears throat> excuse me, ups and downs of the uh, stars, the so-called stars, you know, and singers and stuff like that. I mean, they they get a lot of mileage out of that uh, about the strange lifestyles or whatever <clears throat> of the, um, but yeah, in the very serious news media you wonder what's going on and these are in mainstream media so uh, yeah I, well, you I, don't get I don't more mainstream than yeah no more mainstream than NBC and, and Matt Lauer that's about as mainstream as it gets yeah uh, and our these uh, I regard what's going on as a massive distraction away from the things that really do affect the daily lives of men and women in this country. I was just reading Goldman Sachs uh, analyst saying that uh, uh, there, there's very few precedents for what's going on in, in the uh, stock and bond market right now, those two precedents being the Roaring Twenties and the Golden Fifties, the 1950s, that the uh, bear market inevitably will return. Um, and when Goldman Sachs makes a statement like that, I think people should uh, sit up and pay attention, don't you, Jim? Well, it's it's like they're doing wishful thinking, like uh, because the the stock market is um, is a runaway train, and you know typically uh, it's been controlled by 
uh, the banking forces, and they what they would do is they would just plan a little you know, a Black Friday or a Black Monday, in which they the big people would sell off, and the people standing on the floor of the stock market by eight oh five realized this, and then started selling what they could sell. With, you know, but by that time, the crash had already occurred, and they're standing there only responding to something and then the big money people come back you know over the next number of weeks and buy back things at at sort of lower discount rates and make all this money they just suck all the money out of the stock market and we've seen this happen many times that's why i don't have stocks i, I think it's like right. you'd be better off playing las vegas or well, reno it, it except is. for shooters they are <laughs> they are casinos but but uh I agree with what you're saying, Jim, but but it goes a bit deeper than than what you said. Um, yeah, the Great Depression and what happened in 1929 is a good example. Um, the, the big money people, you're right, they they uh, got out of the market early while it was high, knowing that there was going to be a contrived crash, and then after it crashed, now the uh, the real wealth of this country is mines, factories, and farms. That's what creates wealth, um, mines, factories, and farms. So they were able, they being the, the wealthy people, were able to buy the real wealth of America, mines, factories, and farms, for five cents on the dollar uh, towards the middle and the end of the Great Depression. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and that's, that, that's, how, that's, where the, that's, what they're, that's what the plan is. Is to be able to do this again. The uh, grandchildren of the people who did this in the 1930s, grandchildren and great grandchildren, uh, stand ready to once again sell all their sell all their major assets before the made before the crash, and then come in and buy the mines, factories, and farms for five cents on the dollar. It's a it's a pretty smart program if you're uh, you know on the inside and are par- are part of it, isn't it, Jim? Well, the only problem is they've got some guy in the White House now named Trump who doesn't work by the same uh, standards. You know, if you had Hillary Clinton there, she'd be in with the Rothschilds and the bankers. She'd be part of it and uh, lining herself up for for being part of it. Uh, but right now what you have going on, the reason the stock market is high is because of the massive amount of investment coming into the United States both with corporations that had hit all their money offshore and foreign investors who are uh, wildly investing in the United States right now. Well, they're, they're, the foreign investors are looking for a safe haven for their uh, money is what they're doing. And the uh, U.S. is looked at, looked at as a safe haven with the turmoil going on in many other parts of the world. Uh, Yes, absolutely, they are. Um, well, let's move on from there, Jim. Um, the other big news, of course, this morning is the missile launch uh, yesterday, I believe it was, by North Korea. And uh, the range, now the uh, analysts are saying uh, they can now reach Washington, D.C., uh, ignoring the fact that, uh, that the former director of the CIA, Woolsey, uh, said a couple of months ago, I believe September, that those two satellites that go over the United States every 12 hours on a polar orbit do, in fact, have nuclear weapons in them, which could take out this country by EMP if they chose to. Um, so there's a there's a lot to digest here, and, and uh, a lot a lot of information that uh, we need to be aware of. And uh, I, I don't believe people need to be too caught up in this, except to understand there's threats and to make their personal preparations to deal with the threats. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I heard your, also your prepper tip of the day at the beginning about food and water, which I agree with. Uh, but I encourage people, if they haven't gotten their own water filtration system, and, and gravity is the only one, and make sure it's a uh, it's not a black carbon filter. If you have black carbon filters, they are not for emergency because they're not cleanable. And uh, that's nice when you're pouring nice water from your uh, kitchen faucet into them, but try pouring some flood water or something from the pond into them, and they'll be plugged in about 10 minutes. 
So you need uh, the ceramic white filters, and you also need ceramic filters that that take out all of the pollutants that are in today's water, uh, which mine are the only ones that do that. So anyway, John, you mentioned that you sell those, but what I encourage people to do if they've not yet purchased a water filter, uh, the uh, I suggest go out and get two five-gallon buckets or containers of water. Uh, in fact, uh, six gallons would be better, and then carry it up and down the block for a couple, you know, as long as you takes for you to get really <laughs> tired. Right. And then imagine carrying a water filter, which weighs about three pounds, up and down the, in fact, less than a gallon of water. Uh, carry that up and down the street for a while. See which one you like to carry more. And so, uh, and storing water is good, but most people don't have a good storage medium. I, I, uh, we have tanks on that page too, but, uh, the reality is most people, 99.99% of all people, do not have appropriate tanks for storing water. So that brings you back to the idea of a, of a filter. Plus, it's portable. You, if you have to move or go someplace, you take it with you, the gravity filters, that is. And so anyway, uh, that's my recommendation. Go out and carry that water up and down the street for a while and figure out you know, um, what's better for you. Uh, carrying water in five gallon buckets or or a filter all right my recollection is five gallons of water weighs 45 pounds does that sound pretty close jim well it's a um a gallon weighs uh about seven pounds so five gallons is uh 35 pounds two of those is 70 pounds and then hanging off the end of your arms and trying to walk uh, go for it, you know. Yeah. And it, it's uh, funny you should mention that the, the uh, Army, U.S. Army, is changing its fitness standards uh, to include some practical exercises. One of them is carrying two five-gallon containers of water a certain distance. I don't recall what the distance is. Uh, and um, that's that's a real-world uh, test because carrying water and carrying and carrying sandbags is another one of those tests a 40 pound sandbag and tossing the 40 pound sandbag over a seven foot barrier is another one of the tests um but you're right the thing uh, the, the thing about water is that it just uh is dead weight you know um it's the difference between carrying a person who's active and a person who's not active you know, the water is just dead weight, and you're trying to carry this, and it's sloshing around in the bucket or whatever, and you're trying to carry it, and, uh, yeah, it gets heavy real quick. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, make your choice. But uh, the other thing is buckets of water don't clean themselves. So you can carry your water all you want, but it's still not clean water. So uh, just simple you know, uh, if you really care for your family, you will have a gravity water filter with ceramic filters that are uh, that have the proper internals that will take out what you're going to meet in the field today. You know, for floods, how many people who are in a flooding situation, if you walk down the street in Houston before the hurricane a week before and said, you know, you better get yourself a water filter, uh, how many people would look at you like you were crazy? Well, exactly. after the hurricane, that's the first thing they all need it. So, absolutely, Jim. We got a caller and holder. We got Dennis in Wisconsin. Good morning, Dennis. Uh, good morning, John and Jim. Uh, I had a question. I, I wanted to get some astronomical binoculars, and I know Jim had talked about them before. I, I wonder if he had any advice. And do you need a tripod for these? Uh, okay, you do need a tripod. Uh, because you don't want to be out there standing there. They're good to use. The nice thing about binoculars is you don't need to use a tripod. You can look around. And what I like to do is uh, lean them up against something, and then you can move around, etc. But if you're looking at something, uh, like right now there's a couple comets up there that you can see with binoculars. And... Uh, uh, so, yes, you need a, a good tripod, not the skinny little kind you get at the photo store. You need a good tripod. So, once again, uh, get your astronomical equipment and 
uh, binoculars are much better than a small telescope. Uh, there's more tel- small telescopes sitting in closets today than anything else. So yes, I have. Go t- yeah, go to an astronomical store online, or if you are lucky enough to have one near you, I know down San Diego there's a few. I'm trying to think of other places I've been. You know, sometimes, you know, go online. If you can actually go there, that's good. You know, support those uh, local stores. But if not, go online. And I recommend getting, well, you have to get coated optics, 100% coated optics, which means that the lenses are ground and then they coat them to make, to give you a very perfect surface. And that really increases when you're looking at faint things up in the sky, you need all the help you can get. So you have to have 100% coated lenses and optics. So the prisms, everything have to be coated. And typically that's the case when you're buying from an astronomical store. You know, and expect to pay a bit. I've got various pairs, but my favorite is a big pair, and they have, uh, I think, 50 millimeter. Uh, uh, but you can get, I won't say a number, as I don't recall offhand, but big, big, big lenses. And also make sure that the lenses where your eyes are are big. A lot of cheap binoculars have little teeny lenses, and they're hard. They're real hard on your eyes to look through. So uh, good. Be prepared to spend some money and get some good large. I mean the the kind that are really really big, like a foot foot and a half long, and get yourself a decent tripod, and then go out and get a you know star chart. And right now there's a comet called C twenty sixteen R two that's doing some real uh, activity up in the sky. And, uh, you know, you can see these with good binoculars. You know, when you say okay. how much, are you, $500 Dennis, or more? You're- Dennis, hold, it, hold on, Dennis. We've got a break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details, many photographs, and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. Wednesday, the 29th to November. Uh, Dennis, let's uh, continue with your comments, please, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I was just saying, uh, any price range, uh, uh, Jim, that uh, I should uh, uh, not go under? Well, I'm just pulled up, and the price of these things has come way down. I think that's like anything. If they sell enough of them, they can get the price down. And I'm seeing some Celestron... Skymaster with uh, like a 25 power, that's 20 to 25. You don't want to go more than that with 
uh, astronomical binoculars because uh, you want a wide field of view. Uh, but uh, the exit uh, or the incoming, the big lens is out in the front. Uh, you want to be 80 millimeters or bigger. Uh, but also very important is that the eyepiece lens. But all of these, like Celestron and those, I'm not advertising for them. I'm just saying that's a, a brand that's, sure. uh, they will have fully coated optics. You know, and this is, they're competing with other brands. Uh, but here's one for like $74. You know, oh my Lord. And so if, yeah. if you're camping and stuff like that, it's also good to have some kind of a sponge coating on them. So if you bump them around, they, those optics are real sensitive. And then also have a strap on them so that uh, in, when you give it to your best buddy or your kids, make sure they have the strap on because the first thing they're going to do is drop them. Uh, and so uh, I was on a camping trip one time, and this guy goes, can I use your binoculars? And I said, if you put the, str- I said, if you put the strap on, I don't need a strap. The first thing he did is bounce it off a rock and into the lake, <laughs> dropped it. So anyway, uh, make sure you have a strap on it. And that I myself put a strap on it because you know it's just uh, a safety thing for good optics, you know. And so, uh, but you can go up into the hundreds of dollars, you know, many hundreds of dollars. Here was one for a couple hundred. And but make sure that the eyepiece that you look through is big, because that is what allows you to look through these for a long period of time. So I see one here is four. Yeah, one is four millimeters. That's pretty small. You want a really, really big, you know, like a centimeter, ten centimeter or ten millimeters or something, Uh, and that costs money. So anyway. But if you're spending that much money, yeah, dig deep in your pocket because you're not going to buy this twice. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, expert advice. You're welcome, Dennis. You're welcome. Thank you for the call. Uh, Jim, I I, uh, at one time took a Celestron uh, astronomical telescope and converted it to run with a 35-millimeter camera, which I use uh, for surveillance purposes. It worked out really nice. I Mm -hmm. I I could photograph anything. Any distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was it was quite. Uh, one investigator friend of mine bought it from me. Uh, Jim, we got a bottom of the hour break coming up. Uh, tell us real quick how people can listen to your radio show, please. Yeah, every Thursday evening, six p.m. Central Time, uh, WWCR, Nashville, Tennessee. The frequencies are on my web page for the now the winter time frequency, and then re-airs on WTWW on. Friday night, 10 p.m., Saturday morning, 3 a.m., and then my paid cast is available, $3.95 a month, is available on my webpage, an extra hour every week of scientific, pure scientific information. So I encourage people to go there. Uh, my webpage is jmccsci.com, and, John, you have a link there from your page. That's right. Absolutely. Well, we had a lot of... Di- a lot of- a lot to cover here, Bob and the hour break coming up momentarily. And um, we'll, uh, as soon as the break's over, we'll get back to discussing the issues of the day. I think uh, we're going to have a president advocating, saying Merry Christmas to each other. We may even have schools go back to having a Christmas break instead of a winter break. What do you think, Jim? Well, uh, interesting. I mean, it is, uh, was developed as a Christian nation. I, there's, there seems to be no problem with talking about Muslim nations, but there does seem to be a political correctness about saying this is a Christian nation. And, of course, that was designed to destroy it because uh, they don't like, you know, it's anyway, uh, not going into all of that. But, uh, yeah, that's interesting for yes. people who are Christians and grew up in this country and uh, of, of all walks of life. Uh, so the, that's uh, I, I like it, you know. It's like, I do too. I do too. I, I would love to see these uh, school boards uh, 
take to have the courage to call the Christmas break to Christmas break instead of the winter break. Uh, that would be excellent, and it really needs to happen. Uh, well, there's, there's sure, no place so. that's gotten more political correctness uh, than the school board. That's, that seems like the case. We have a break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Jim, we're back. J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 29th of November. My website is thelibertyman.com. That's thelibertyman.com. A quick update here, and this is more for the benefit of uh, Professor McCanny than the regular listeners. Our newest image of North America with a new coastline, it's an image from a documentary about the uh, bogus make-believe religion called Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, the image shows L. Ron Hubbard in a brown tuxedo standing next to a globe, and the globe does not have Florida or Baja California on it. That's just recently posted earlier this week at my website at thelibertyman.com. The uh, listener who found that, uh, they uh, picked one of my five DVDs as a thank you. That was shipped to them uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And uh, the project moves forward. If you have time to watch movies and TV shows, uh, the last 65 years or so worth of TV shows and movies, keep an eye out for an- another image of a continent with new coastlines. Get the screen capture, get that to me, and you also get to pick any of my five DVDs as a thank you. Also, my website are energy cleaners and mattress pads. This is my home business. This is what I do. When you place your order, I'm the guy that packs up the energy cleaner, takes it to the counter at the little country post office in Cherryville, Missouri, where there's a all-you-can-eat catfish buffet every Friday for less than $10. And when you get a mattress pad, I'm the guy that reconfigures them and does the same thing. I pack them up and take them to the little country post office in Cherryville, Missouri, where the guys sit around the round table and talk about deer hunting and fishing and cattle. <laughs> and a myriad of other topics, uh, who's got the best rifle and so forth. Only $285 for an energy cleaner. Uh, if you have any issues with pain or sleep, you need an energy cleaner. Keep in mind, I have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Toll-free order line, 24 hours a day. Don't try to call me. This is an order line only, 800-592-9543. I say again, 800-592-9543. Visiting with Professor James McCanny. His website is linked to my links page. Uh, Jim, there's uh, the, the war drums are beating, uh, to say the least. Um, the things I'm reading from uh, both uh, open source and from private sources have me very concerned. I I got an, an alert on the top of my website right now, Jim, as of Monday. My my understanding recently has been that uh, Obama's uh, administration was actively blocking any attempt to protect the national power grid. It wasn't. It was not just a matter of the normal dysfunction in Washington D.C. in the swamp, uh, and, and was something that was inadvertent. N- no, it was actually an active attempt to block the recommendations of the EMP Commission to protect the national power grid. I only. I can only come to one conclusion, Jim. That conclusion being that. The Obama administration and President Hussein Obama himself wanted to make this country vulnerable to EMP attack. Your response, sir? Well, now, what was the recommendation of the committee? Was it the smart grid? No, no. 
No, no. The smart grid is it does not protect the power grid, and, and you and I had some private communication with that. That's that's, got, that's nothing to do with protecting from EMP. Uh, right. That would be a matter of uh, the proper equipment properly installed to protect the national power grid so that uh, it would not be permanently damaged by EMP attack. Um, so, no, the smart grid is something else. That's a matter of... Well, uh, in there, I just so. wanted to mention this, too, in, in my communication with you, that in Obama was pushing the smart grid. Exactly. As, and, and they were trying to push it as being something that could protect the grid. But it was a giant boondoggle to put a lot of computerized equipment on the grid to monitor things, and primarily it was meant to monitor people and shut off their power if they were not good citizens, according to the Obama uh, criteria. And so, uh, which uh, you know, if Hillary would have been elected, you would all be monitored right now for good behavior. You would be going to happy camps. Uh, this was going to accelerate into like a never never land that you never you couldn't even imagine, but that didn't happen. Uh, but the, the smart grid was designed, uh, it was uh, to have computer equipment. The problem was that in an EMP, that's moving at the speed of light in the ground, in the air, and a computer, by the time it decides an EMP happened, that signal is already passed at the speed of light, and it's going to the next station where the computers are going to be sitting there trying to figure out what to do. So a smart grid was the exact way to not protect the grid. Uh, but uh, Tesla designed the shunts. They're called shunts. And basically it's an inductor, So it, and it acts naturally when an EMP or a pulse comes in an, an electric circuit. It blocks it naturally, and it could also uh, trigger opening up that circuit physically instantaneously to block any further activity. So you would basically isolate the grid elements, and the grid is set up to do that. It's just that we're, it was never designed for EMPs. It was only designed for surges, normal surges within the, uh, uh, like lightning bolts or things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, the, the grid uh, is a is subject to damage from EMPs. So, uh, but it, it's an effort that has to take time. It takes equipment, extra equipment, more than what's there, but it has to be what we call passive. In other words, non-intelligent shunts, and these are inductors basically, which block changes in the electromagnetic field that's in the system. And as soon as it senses that, by setting up a, a reverse EMF in the circuit, it blocks it. And if, if it gets to a certain point, it's like any kind of fuse. A fuse is a dumb element in a circuit. And it's simply set to burn out at, you know, 20 amps, like in your common in your house, 15 or 20 amps. If you go over that, you either trip it or burn out the fuse. And it's a dumb element but it opens up the circuit, so nothing else can pass through that circuit. Uh, but anyway, that takes time and money, etc. It, it does. It does. The, uh, according to the AMP Commission, the, the entire national power grid could be protected for the equivalent dollar amount of one and one third B1 bombers. Uh, just to put it in terms that, that people can analyze and make some sense of the way they spend money and throw money around up there uh jim uh that's that's not a lot when it when it is inevitable that even if there's not a man-made emp it is in fact inevitable that at some point in time a coronal mass ejection will smack this planet um in a manner that it did in 1859 with the carrington event and in fact we we barely missed one in 2012 um and it's just a matter of time before one does, in fact, hit this planet. Uh, so it needs to happen. And uh, the, uh, by the way, the EMP Commission's funding was uh, uh, taken away in September, and so the EMP Commission is is no longer um, in service. By the way, hmm. yeah, as, well, of, it, as of September. Yeah, uh, but it, it does have to happen, and. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's something that's very doable. It's very simple. 
but it takes time and money. And the end result is damage to the grid. Uh, most of the equipment is made offshore right now for the, the big transformers and the, when you see a, a wired off region with the, a grid substation, that equipment is not readily available in a warehouse someplace. And so damage to the grid would be very difficult to repair. Uh, plus all the infrastructure that depends on, ele- on electricity would be in, uh, would not be functional. So, uh, uh, to repair and, you know, t- uh, like for example, just getting trucks with de- to, uh, electric pumps to pump fuel into the trucks to move the equipment. Right. You know, the infrastructure is 100% dependent on electricity. Right. Well, let me give the shorthand version of what you're saying here, Jim. Everything you need to fix what's broken is also broken. Right. <laughs> so, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, and it's the estimates are that nine out of ten Americans in the first twelve months would be dead uh, from uh, disease, drinking bad water, lack of food, starvation, so forth, um, lack of medication. Yeah, uh, how many percent? Be, what nine, was the percent? Nine, nine, out of, nine out of ten. Nine out of ten Americans would be dead the first twelve months because of uh, lack of clean drinking water and food and medication would be gone. Um, you know, the average American takes consumes four pharmaceutical prescription products a day, um, uh, and, and some consume none, like myself. Some consume eight, ten, or twelve a day. Uh, those will be gone in two to four weeks. Uh, right. The first drink, the first drink of bad water you take is a one-way ticket to a dehydration, diarrhea, and death. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a bad, bad scenario that uh, is a clear and present danger. Uh, we need lots of things to protect this country besides missiles and marines. We also need to protect, protect the power grid. And keep in mind that the former head of the CIA, uh, uh, Admiral Woolsey, came out in September saying that those two North Korean satellites that go over us on a polar orbit every 12 hours, uh, they have nuclear devices in them as well. Um, so we we certainly have a, a situation here where, where we're very ripe for the pickings in my in my belief. Yeah, it's, I'm not sure how to get. I've tried to get information up into the upper levels of this country, and even with Trump, it's difficult now. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, possibly you have some mechanisms. If those top generals cannot do it. I mean, how are you or me or some other, you know, John Q. Public going to do it? Or Susie Q. Public? (laughs) Uh, Whatever. Exactly. Well, all we can do is take care of ourselves and the people we care about. We don't have any control over these big matters. Um, Yeah. yeah, And that's what I advocate is people take control of their own lives and make sure that their family is going to be provided for Uh, and these these events are going to run their course, uh, whether we do something or don't do something. They're going to run their course. That's inevitable. Uh, but people can be prepared. People can take charge and do something positive, regardless of their financial wherewithal. Even if you've only got can clean out two two liter soda bottles and fill them with clean drinking water, that's better than nothing. Whatever it takes, do something. Uh, Bag, bags of beans and rice from the local supermarket don't cost a whole lot. Stock up on those. Uh, and, of course, I advocate be- people being part of a hobby farm uh, 100 or more miles from a major city at a good elevation. I think that's the best solution to all these things, don't you, Jim? Well, yeah, a garden and a greenhouse, which allows you three-season greens uh, and have uh, some chickens or something like that, is uh a good plan. It is. So, uh, you know, this, uh, people just, uh, are totally dependent on, uh, going to the grocery store. And that's going to end in about three minutes, uh, you know, if you're in a major city. That's so, right. Uh, John, I was going to mention yesterday, uh, the 28th of November, uh, we usually have about 12 or 15 what we call fireballs. 
that come into the atmosphere. These are just uh, normal everyday occurrences. Yesterday we had 91, which was very interesting. And uh, some days you hardly see any, and like yesterday there was a flurry of these. Most of these are pieces of rock that are actually in orbit around Earth, and uh, they're uh, um, uh, finally coming into our atmosphere and burning up. But uh, sometimes it peaks, and it looks like yesterday we had a peak. Um, I also wanted to mention that isn't it interesting in a year where all of a sudden in late August we had this flurry of hurricanes for no reason at all, all of a sudden, again, there are none. So isn't that interesting? And don't you think the, the boys and girls up at the Hurricane Prediction Center would say, well, gee, isn't that funny? We had all of these major hurricanes, every single one of them, did major damage to land uh, masses, you know, and repeatedly some of them, and all of a sudden there's none again. Well, if if El Nino or La Nina or any of their other bogus uh, m motivations for hurricanes are true, then shouldn't we just, like, still have hurricanes? Unless they're man-made, of course. <laughs> Good point, Jim. You're pointing out the obvious, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it takes someone like yourself to point out the obvious. And, um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, of course, the, the, the head of the, uh, Hurricane Center, uh, resigned, uh, a couple of two, was it about three or four years ago? A um, number of years ago, Dr. William Gray, and, uh, he said, None of, nothing they're doing there has any validity at all. Those are his exact words. And uh, he was the guy that helped develop all of the computer systems to predict hurricanes and the paths of hurricanes, etc. And he said it is not a single bit of validity to any of it. Well, that's pretty damning evidence. And, of course, somebody took his place and is drawing a paycheck, looking forward yep. to a pension for doing all this bogus work uh, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Exactly. Yep. And well, uh, you, you know, well, I found out early as a very young man in the U.S. Army that the, uh, uh, that, that, that the temptation of a paycheck and a pension will have men – uh, involved in employment that they don't particularly care for. Most of the Green Berets I worked with at, at Fort Bragg were headed up, were just absolutely disgusted with the Vietnam War. And, and, uh, but they had, they had families, uh, wives and children. They had, uh, invested uh, a lot of time in a career. And they, the, re the adult responsible thing to do was to stay in that career. Uh, drawing that paycheck and getting that pension to retire at about age 40 or 45 years old and go on with their lives. Um, but that's what a paycheck and a pension will do, is get men and women to do things that they really don't want to do. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, that you see that every place. You see it in science. Science is ripe with people who are there just collecting a paycheck, you know, whether it's global warming or comets or dirty snowballs, uh, you know, seeing those kids going to college and making sure your career is solid so that the house payment gets made right. and the, right. the wife has a, a, you know, and your retirement is coming. <laughs> well, well no, it's, what, it's, what, it's, it's, what is more important, right. truth or that paycheck? Well, people will put the paycheck ahead of the truth. We got a call and hold. We got a break. Stay tuned. Be right back. Jim, we're back. J.R. Moore here. Uh, we are trying to get these phone calls in here, Jim. First, we go to Rick in Missouri. Good morning, Rick. 
Okay, I'll go quick. Um, the uh, you know we have uh, uh, Matt Lauer. Maybe you mentioned it. Got of course canned for sexual right. improprieties this morning. Earlier, that was great news. These lefties seem to have a real problem keeping their pants up, or the girls their skirts uh, down. But uh, and I almost hesitate to mention this because you know I think we're all going to feel like we need a uh, shower with broken glass and salt when it's over. But Trump's never-ending gun battle with. Rosie O'Donnell, who, whom he claims is a disgusting person. Apparently, she has a new show out there now um, uh, called S M I L T F Single Moms. I'd like to, and then you have the F. You don't need a uh, you don't need a wind talker, a code talker, to figure this out. It's not a real advanced uh, code. Uh, made a statement on one of the recent shows about Jesus Christ. And Mary and, and indicated that Mary was probably sexually abused and would have liked to have had an abortion. So uh, I almost hesitate to bring this up this close to Christmas, but you know these these people, these this deep state and these crazy people, they're not even close to done uh, with the Christians. They're just not not going to give up. So I just thought I would. I know that's not about uh, 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 binoculars, which by the way, that was a fascinating thing. Um, I will, uh, but I'll let you. I'll let you get on to your other callers. Okay, thank you for the call, Rick. Any follow-up there, Jim? Before we go to our next caller. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. And the uh, entertainment, so-called entertainment business, is ripe with people with really distorted brains. I mean, uh, I was recently in uh, Chicago, and they were talking about Oprah Winfrey buying the top two floors of one of the towers there to convert into her personal uh, abode. And uh, the deal fell through because she couldn't cut the flooring out between them, and they wouldn't allow her to because it was a structural issue of the building. Um, <laughs> and so she bought another place. <laughs> you know, it's disgusting. These people are disgusting people. Amazing. Let's get our last anyway. call here. Dan in Missouri. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I apologize. I tuned in a little late. Professor, if you haven't touched on Fukushima, could you bring us up to date, and I'll listen to you on the radio? Thank yeah, you. The, the Fukushima, the Japanese want to dump a lot of bad water, less uh, polluted water, into the ocean. Because they have, they've not done anything, and uh, Fukushima is an international disaster. Nobody's paying any attention to it. It could have been solved in the beginning. Now it's a, it's an economic or ecological and economic disaster. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't, I'm speechless. It's beyond, uh, beyond the pale. Jim, uh, I, I know we're almost out of time, but uh, the, those the first few days, the Japanese were more or less pretending it wasn't happening and not soliciting any outside help. If, if expert help had gotten there uh, from outside sources those first few days, could it have had a different outcome? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they could that's, have shut it down. Yeah. yeah. No, right. That's absolutely. what I thought. That's what I thought. And well, Obama didn't do anything either on purpose, just like the BP oil spill. Right, Obama right. blocked the companies from getting in there that could have done something. Make it as bad as possible. Jim, thank you, sir. Have you back next week. Thank you, John. Okay, top of the hour break. We'll have open lines after the break. Stay tuned. All right, we're back. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 29th of November. Prepper tip of the day. I want to encourage all of you to check your food supply and water supply if you keep water at home. Uh, a minimum 30-day supply of water. I like to have a two-year supply of food on hand. It should be hopefully enough to get uh, through whatever crisis might be coming our way. And um, that's the prepper tip of the day. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, check your water supply. Check your food supply. Make sure that the uh, food has not been damaged by um, humidity or heat or insects or mice. There's lots of things that want to get at your food and cause harm to it. We have open lines this hour. Take your questions, calls, and comments here at Republic Broadcasting at 800-313-1450. 800-313-1450. 
1-800-273-9443. There was an alert posted at my website at thelibertyman.com concerning my concern about the uh, national power grid intentionally, not inadvertently, intentionally made vulnerable by the Obama administration these past eight years, uh, intentionally stopping with intent and design, stopping the recommendations of the EMP Commission. This is the commission of scientists and engineers appointed to determine what the threats are to the national power grid and how to mitigate those threats, intentionally blocking those recommendations from being implemented. Uh, so read that alert. There's also some excellent articles. Uh, Dave Hodge is going to good good uh, job posting some articles about the threat of EMP to this country. My friend Paul Martin. His website is uh, revolutionradio.org, I believe. Uh, you need to educate yourself on this. I sincerely do. Also, my website is the uh, link on the right side there. Uh, the uh, field training exercise, USS Liberty, December 31st, 2018. This is my response to... Requests for years, people asking me, John, when's it going to happen? Well, this is my response to that request. I give five different scenarios. You get to pick your own, whatever that might be, and um, prepare for it, giving yourself a, a date to uh, be done by, that date being December 31st, 2018. That's 13 months away. 13 months will pass really quickly. And the older you get, the more quickly these years pass by, it seems like. Pick a scenario. You might pick two or three, or you might pick all five to get ready for. That's your choice. I'm giving you the date. I'm giving you the possible scenarios. And it's your choice to, to begin preparing or enhance your preparations as you see fit. All I'm doing is, is hopefully providing a little guidance and a little motivation. That's my job, is to provide some guidance and motivation. Your job is to either pick up the challenge, well, or not. That's certainly your choice. I respect that. I don't have an emotional attachment to what you do or don't do. And I tell this to people all the time. I, I do private consultations. If you, if you, in fact, if you need a private consultation, the details on how to do that are, are there at my website. I do public presentations and private consultations both. But my clients typically are married couples, and most of the time, uh, these couples are on the same page in terms of spending family resources. That would be time and money on preparedness. Occasionally, I get a client, just one spouse or, or the other, and there just doesn't seem to be any breakdown of, uh, in terms of percentage other than 50-50, male, 50-50, female. One spouse wants to uh, get prepared. The other one doesn't want to spend family resources on that time and money. That's a difficult situation to be in when, when both spouses are not on the same page. It makes things difficult. But the, uh, the spouse who wants to spend family resources moves forward in the best way they can without upsetting the other spouse and and gets get as much done as they can. Yes, <clears throat> it's difficult. When both spouses move together, work together, things happen much more quickly much more efficiently, a lot more gets done in a, in a more timely manner. That's the best, that's the best way to, for this to happen. One of the things that, I, that I've advocated that uh, people use to convince their spouse that this is a reasonable thing, not an outlandish thing, is to use the uh, example of insurance. And sometimes it's an issue with Christians also. People will respond, well, God will take care of me. Well, my response to the Christian saying that is the following. Do you, does, do you take care of your car uh, insurance, or do you expect God to take care of that for you? Do, you? do you buy homeowner's insurance, or do you expect God to take care of that for you? 
do you buy health insurance or do you expect God to take care of that for you? Well, obviously, in each of those examples, they don't expect God to take care of it. Uh, they take care of these things themselves. Life insurance, health insurance, automobile insurance, homeowner's insurance. Being prepared is just another form of insurance. Insurance against going hungry. Insurance against not having water. Insurance against the criminals who want to come and kidnap your teenage daughter and your wife. It's just another form of insurance is all it is. There's a plus, there's a plus side to this equation, however, and a big plus. When you pay all these other types of insurance, homeowners, life insurance, health insurance, automobile insurance, at the end of the at the end of the year, you have a stack of canceled checks, or the electronic versions these days of the canceled checks. When it comes to preparedness, you actually have three dimensional items that you can use. You can always eat the food. Water, well, water typically doesn't cost that much, but the water is there to be used. Other items might be first aid equipment, communications equipment, defensive items such as rifles, shotguns, pistols, maybe a motor vehicle that's been retrofitted to be EMP proof. These are all things that you can use, you can consume, you can sell. Try selling a canceled check to your from your health insurance, see how far that goes. So there is an advantage to preparedness that these type of insurance that these other types of insurance don't offer, which is you really do have three-dimensional objects that can be used at some future date. It's The analogy of insurance is understandable, politically neutral, and non-threatening. And it's a good analogy to use that may, there's no silver bullet when it comes to convincing a spouse. I can't guarantee it would work, but it might work. It might work, and that's what that's what's important to have a viable option there for convincing the spouse. When I advocate under the USS Liberty training field training exercise, is getting a spiral notebook, just the kind of same old spiral notebook like you had in high school. Get it from you know Walmart or the dollar store, or whatever, and. Make a master list, first of all. A master list of things you want to accomplish, goals that you want to accomplish. Maybe training goals. It may be a goal to uh, become part of a hobby farm. Uh, Possibly uh, your food storage goals. Maybe a motor vehicle store goal for EMP-resistant vehicle. And then dedicate one page to each of those goals. Because as you work towards achieving those goals is going to be contact information for vendors and people and training facilities, whatever it might be, that you work on incrementally, piece by piece, goal by goal, as you go through the next 13 months. I did this um, myself. I still have my spiral notebook uh, from the late 90s, getting ready for Y2K which was a real clear and present danger, by the way, a man-made event that had a man-made solution, a man-made problem with a man-made solution. Or you might say an engineering problem with an engineering solution. Uh, Corporate America and government bought 10 years' worth of computers in two years to solve this problem, which for the most part was solved. And I have to give them credit where credit was due. They did mostly solve it. The first two, three months of 2000, year 2000, there were some uh, issues with various entities, but um, but we got through it okay. We did. Let's talk a little bit about EMP-resistant vehicles. Uh, I I have uh, converted uh, several vehicles. Uh, actually, two vehicles to be MP proof. One is a 1975 International Scout. That was a that was an easy fix. All I had to do was change out the uh, electronic uh, ignition for a points condenser ignition. 
That was pretty simple and very inexpensive. And then my 1988 Dodge van. Uh, I went to a Dodge expert, and I, I we talked about the project and what it would take to accomplish it, the goal being to bypass or eliminate everything in that 1988 Dodge that had a transistor-resistor diode in it, which he did. Um, he, he bypassed or eliminated all those things. So the 1988 Dodge basically is the same as the 1972 Dodge when it comes to what the, what electrical equipment it takes to make it run. So it's an EMP-resistant vehicle. It's probably easier just to go ahead and, and of course, money is always an issue, to purchase a 1972 or older motor vehicle from Ford, Chevy, or Dodge, uh, a sedan, a truck, pickup truck, whatever it might be. These are easily found on Hemmings Motor News, for example. The Hemmings Motor News is, is the place where an awful lot of motor vehicles are sold. eBay is another one where there's a lot of motor vehicles sold. If you're not competent to properly check out a motor vehicle before purchase, I would make sure a competent mechanic checks out anything you want to buy before purchase. Otherwise, you could end up with a very expensive mistake, buying something that needs a lot of money uh, and time to mitigate and to correct. So a competent mechanic is very important. Uh, for buying any motor vehicle, any used motor vehicle. Um, and uh, I've been doing this myself. I I rarely, rarely buy. In fact, I've only bought one new motor vehicle, and that was back in the 1970s. But uh, I have uh, complete diagnostics done on any motor vehicle. Typically, I buy a used car from a dealer and then the, get a dealer warranty with that used car. And that, that certainly gives me some peace of mind. It's worked out for me pretty well over the years, having a dealer warranty uh, standing behind the vehicle. Um, if you're not buying one with a dealer warranty, be sure you get complete diagnostics done before you buy it. Seriously, you'll be very glad you did. An independent mechanic or a dealer, either one. Uh, AAA has a service where they have certain inspection stations that will do complete diagnostics. Uh, I know in, in Metro St. Louis, they had a, a diagnostic center for years that um, did excellent, excellent work. There was a fire and it burned down, and they never rebuilt it. And I really liked that service and took advantage of it a number of times uh, before purchasing a motor vehicle. And they did the most detailed diagnostics that you can that you can imagine. I mean, very, very detailed. Uh, great guys and, and uh, great equipment that they had there to do those testing. But you can still have uh, any competent mechanic can do a detailed diagnostics on a motor vehicle. And you'll definitely know um, in great detail what the, what that motor vehicle has and what it needs. 1972, the last year that Ford motor vehicles had a point condenser ignition. 1973, they began with what would, what would be regarded now as a primitive form of electronic ignition. And it was several years before computers started creeping into the picture. Now we're at a point in 2017 where these motor vehicles are just filled top to bottom, left to right with computers, multiple computers throughout the vehicle. Not just one, but multiple computers and electronics both. Uh, retrofitting a 2017 car or truck to be, uh, to bypass all that would be, um, burdensome <laughs> to say the least. I'm not sure it could even be done. Uh, I guess spending enough money, something, uh, it could be done, but it, it might be, it would be very, very, uh, burdensome in terms of time and money to do that. Uh, 1972 and older motor vehicles. They're simple. You open up the hood, you can actually see the ground, which 
You can't anymore in most of these motor vehicles. They were simple, simple mechanical devices. And um, they will run. If it's made 1972 or earlier, and it's still got the original equipment in terms of what makes it run, EMP won't bother it at all. That might be some peace of mind for a lot of people, knowing that they have a, a car or a truck or a motorcycle that will run following an EMP attack. Fuel's going to be an issue real quick. Spare parts, long-term spare parts and fuel, are going to be big issues. Like Jim McCanney mentioned earlier uh, about fuel, uh, it, the electricity to pump the fuel will no longer be there. And, of course, these refineries that uh, make the fuel in the first place, they're, they're filled top to bottom, left to right, with electronics also. They'll be down for the count. So you can't count on having very much fuel. Whatever you got is what you got. You'll, you may be able to recover fuel from disabled vehicles. And um, otherwise, you're going to be on your own. Here's our break. Call numbers 800 313 9443. Ladies and gentlemen. J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details, many photographs, and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. Jeremy Moore here on Wednesday, the 29th of November. Taking questions, calls, and comments at 800-313-9443. We got uh, Jimmy Gensling with Desert Eagle here on uh, on hold. Go ahead, Jimmy. Good morning, John. Um, just heard some notes uh, yesterday afternoon that uh, the national reciprocity bill is back in play again. Um, well, praise the story Lord. that I got from my sources was that it has enough co-sponsors now that for passage, and there is a lot of pressure being put on Ryan to get it off the uh, waiting list and, and back on the floor. 202-224-3121. Ladies and gentlemen, call your congressman and tell them to get this to the floor before Christmas. Uh, I think I think maybe some of the listeners, along with a bunch of other folks, you ought to have been putting some pressure on Congress. Well, I, I hope so. And, and uh, national, here, well, here's what for people who don't know what we're talking about reciprocity when it comes to concealed carry. Reciprocity are agreements between the fifty attorney generals, um, uh, and and this is these agreements take place pretty uh, person to person. Typically with letters is all it takes as opposed to laws. And um, many of the 50 states have reciprocity with the other 50 states, but there's quite a few that don't. And uh, it's caused uh, a lot of harm to 
otherwise completely innocent people that uh, are traveling uh, peaceably from state to state uh, with their firearms legally possessed and get in trouble because their their state doesn't share reciprocity reciprocity with another state. Uh, so this will give people the ability to travel uh, freely between the 50 states and not become criminals because they, they cross a line in the sand between two states. Um, you exactly. Know, uh, and um, the uh, good example of this, ladies and gentlemen, is in New Jersey. Uh, several years back, a woman in a neighboring state got her concealed carry license, and in that state, uh, whenever you're pulled over, the first thing that you do is you hand the uh, officer your driver's license and your concealed carry license and tell them that, yes, you have a gun in the car. And this woman got pulled over for a broken taillight and did exactly what she was taught to do. Officer comes up, he hands him her driver's license or concealed carry license, and he says, do you have a gun in the car? She said, yes. Pulled her out, arrested her, and she was in jail for nine months for having an illegal weapon with an illegal magazine and the wrong type of ammunition. She had hollow points, and evidently there they've got a hollow point ban. And uh, this was right in the middle of the uh, uh, primaries and everything, John, and Chris Christie was running at the time, and everybody thought he was a big uh, pro-gun guy, and he just let that set and go. Uh, it finally took the NRA and um, Jews for the Preservation of Firearms and hundreds of thousands of people threatening to boycott Jersey uh, for any uh, recreation or visits or anything for them to finally drop the case. And um, this national reciprocity, what it does, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a concealed carry license in... Um, well, let's say, let's say New Mexico. And we go, and we're going to go to the East Coast and go to D.C. and look at all the sites and everything there and go to Virginia. And uh, we've got our concealed carry weapons with us. Now, what it does is it's just like your driver's license, the reciprocity with your driver's license with other states. You're in that state. You're concealed carry but you have to follow their laws. Just like in the car, you have to follow their speed limit. In Texas, it's 75 miles an hour on the back roads. In New Mexico, it's 60. So you go from Texas to New Mexico, you obey the, the uh, traffic laws. Same thing with concealed carry. If in your state you can go into a restaurant with a bar and as long as you're not drinking, have your gun with you, and in the state you're visiting, you cannot have a gun with you any place that serves alcohol. You abide by their laws. So get on the phone, call your congressman, tell them to get this thing out and on the, on the floor for a vote. So it's just good news for us, John. Yeah. It's good news for us. Before you get away, Jimmy, you know, yes, as most people know, I teach, I teach concealed carry training for Missouri. In Missouri... Um, before you go into a, a, a restaurant that serves alcohol and food, you have to make an appointment with the accountant to determine that 51% of gross annual revenue comes from sale of food. Huh. Silence. Okay. I knew that. It, it, it's, yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Thanks for well, your call, Jim. In, in New Mexico, if uh, you're – now, this is a law that's on the books, and I'll, I'll leave you with this one for a giggle for the day. In the traffic laws in New Mexico, when you approach an intersection uh, in the back country, you're supposed to stop 75 feet from the intersection. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. We're continuing our energy cleaner promotion, which began August of 2016. In this promotion, you get to buy an energy cleaner, $70 off retail, and a mattress pad, 10% off retail. $200 at the purchase price of the energy cleaner 
goes to Republic Broadcasting. This is a great way to help get energy cleaners out to people who need them and have some uh, financial issues to deal with. And, of course, a great way to support Republic Broadcasting. Here's what you do. Send in a postcard. My address is John Moore, P.O. Box 201, Davidsville, Missouri. We pick a postcard every two weeks. If your postcard is drawn, uh, you get the chance to buy the energy cleaner $7 off retail and 10% off the mattress pads. Put your name and your address, your telephone number and your email address on the postcard, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 29th of November. My, my website is thelibertyman.com. Thelibertyman.com. Getting a fresh supply of energy cleaners from uh, Tom Berryhill uh, later this week. I got more uh, mattress pads, uh, some of the biggest orders I've ever placed, quite frankly, uh, en route from the, um, the factory. So we'll be able to take care of your orders. Uh, maybe not immediately. Uh, we got covered up with orders this past uh, week or so. But uh, we will get the orders uh, processed and get them out the door as quickly as possible. So uh, it's, I'm, I'm noticing that this is the seventh year I've been doing this. Uh, more and more people are buying them, especially this time of year, for our friends and family, maybe a sibling, maybe a, 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 a child or a parent or a spouse, uh, uh, getting extra energy cleaners to help people that they care about that have issues with pain, issues with getting sleep. I'm noticing, noticing a lot more of that. Um, and, and that's great. That's the way it should be, people taking care of the people they care about. Check out the energy cleaner at my website, the patent application details, the uh, mattress pads. It's a great combination. Most people are going ahead and getting the mattress pad with the energy cleaner at the get-go. Keep in mind, I offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you're risking nothing. I had a very nice conversation with a lady yesterday, and she didn't know I had a 30-day money-back guarantee. And the, the, the tone of her voice changed immediately once she found that out. I do take PayPal, the most secure way to make any payment online, MasterCard, Visa. Of course, you can send me a check. My address is at my website at thelibertyman.com. I have a toll-free hour line 24 hours a day, 800 592 Nine five four three. I say again, eight hundred five nine two nine five four three. You're taking questions, calls, and comments. And um, before last break, Jimmy was trying to t- give us a heads up on um, an arcane uh, part of the uh, uh, Arizona traffic laws down there. Uh, what was it? What is that arcane detail there, Jimmy? Okay, John. It, uh, it's actually New Mexico. New Mexico. But, um, excuse me. The way the law reads is that uh, when you're in the back country or off the main thoroughfares, you pull up to an intersection. You have to stop 300 feet behind the intersection, honk your horn five times, observe to see if there is anything coming in either direction. If nothing is seen, you take out your handgun or your rifle and you fire two shots in the air. Wait to hear if you hear responding two shots. And if not, then you can cross the road, the intersection. The reason that <laughs> law is in place is so that you don't startle people with their horses and buggies. <laughs> well, it seems like gunfire and honking horns would startle horses. Yeah, it's it's one of those arcane laws that uh, stuck there since the 1800s. Have a great one, John, and uh, everybody okay. call your congressmen, senators. Tell them to get this thing on the floor and get a vote on it. All right. Thanks for the call, Jimmy. We appreciate it. Uh, next, we go to John in Missouri. Good morning, John. Hi, Mr. Moore. I was hearing you earlier talking about preparedness, and you mentioned a hobby farm. And my personal belief is that's the most important thing you can do. Uh, I have a farm here in Missouri, and uh, we grow our own food as much as we can. It's a pleasure to sit down to your to your dinner and, and everything that's on your plate you grew. Uh, it's a real feeling of uh, of independence. It is. It is. What county are you in, sir? I'm in Cooper County. Cooper County. All right. Good. I'm we have 113 counties. Uh, right. Right. Boonville and uh, if 
people did this, and I'm not trying to tell people what to do. They can do what they want. But you might find that the farming lifestyle is is the best lifestyle you can have. Uh, our country was built by farmers. You know, people got in covered wagons and came across without any cell phones or computers and made a life for themselves. I'd have to say it's a pretty good life. Guess they didn't have a lot of money, maybe, but they ate. <laughs> well, they, they 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 lived good, good, full, fun, productive lives, didn't they? Yes, yeah, so that's my opinion. Uh, I'm old enough to to remember before cell phones and computers, you couldn't have a cell phone bill and or an internet bill or a cable TV bill. And nowadays, you have to have so much money to spend for all these things that look to me to be not maybe worth it. Uh, the farm is, to me, that's that's how everybody used to live. Ninety-some percent of America lived on the farm, and we done pretty good that way. And We did. We did, and, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate your show and the people you have on it, and uh, keep up the good work, John. And Okay. I'll be listening to you. Okay, John, thank you. We appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. I have uh, men in my neighborhood that are uh, in their 70s and 80s uh, doing manual labor uh, every day of the week. Basically, they take off Sunday to go to church and don't do any manual labor on Sundays. But uh, raising cattle, cutting firewood with chainsaws, uh, repairing equipment, uh, routine, routinely, men in their 70s and 80s that still have a, a fun, healthy lifestyle out here on their ranches and farms. That's pretty common. It's, it's, it's very common, actually. Okay. Um, back to these motor vehicles. Uh, let's talk about fuel a little bit. Storing fuel is an issue. It's dangerous to store fuel, first of all. Gasoline is very explosive, diesel much less so. Uh, things will grow inside the fuel. I mean, it, may, it may be hard to believe, but I've seen what diesel fuel looks like that has been properly treated, and what grows inside there looks like something out of a science fiction film. It's really uh, pretty scary what grows inside diesel fuel. Uh, the company I, that, I, that I help represent, Amsoil, they have some excellent fuel preservatives that you may want to check out. Um, there's another one that I don't sell. It's called PRI. That's Papa Romeo India PRI Delta D for diesel and PRIG Golf for gas. You know, we've had uh, around our place here excellent results using those products, storing fuel successfully for 10 plus years. My neighbors, from, uh, the farmers and ranchers, they say, John, if the gasoline run in a chainsaw, it'll run in anything because you know, the gasoline that runs in chainsaws has to be in, in tip-top condition before the chainsaw will run. Diesel fuel stores a little bit easier and better than gasoline does. It's not as volatile, but you still need to put the proper preservative in it. You really do. The two enemies of, of fuel, or the enemies of fuel are heat and moisture, heat and moisture. You need to protect the fuel from both. Underground storage is the best because it's cooler. And um, uh, if you can get, have underground storage for your fuel, that's the best way to store it. Above ground tanks, they work too. If they can be in the shade, that helps. They cut down the ultraviolet hitting those tanks and, and hunt sunlight heating them up. That helps also. Uh, keep it, keep it, uh, keep the the fuel sealed up tight to keep the moisture from getting there. If you live in an area with high high humidity like I do, uh, and our next caller is Tom in Utah. Good morning, Tom. Hi, hi, John. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I did have a friend who had some underground tanks down in uh, southern Utah. He put fuel in there. Didn't realize that those tanks had corroded. So that's uh -oh. another thing. That if you have underground tanks, you got to watch. Make sure well, that they haven't uh, degraded. What you do is you need to pressure test them and uh, put a, a tight uh, fitting on on the uh, 
top of the tank and do a pressure test to see if it holds pressure. If it won't hold pressure, you got a problem. It needs to be pumped out and and um, either repaired or done away with. Yeah, while I have you, uh, remember I called you the other day and told you about the problem with the manufactured of mobile homes, which a lot of preppers will rely on in terms of shelter. Right. Did you get a chance to look at that website? I know it's I, uh, involved with yeah. a lot of work. If you... I, I, I haven't yet. I have not yet, but it's on my list of things to do, Tom. Yeah, go to gassingamerica.com and make sure you understand that, and then you can you know, warn our, our prepper friends that the, if they have a unit, they can modify it and not be uh, injured by it. The other thing I think I, I didn't mention is the fact that if they're using a cook stove or a oven inside that blow box, if it's not uh, vented, the gases from that cooktop and the oven will build up inside there, and if you have a a, a, a mother who's carrying a baby in utero or she has a toddler or infant around her that can be injurious to that toddler or infant or the fetus. Like there's a high number of miscarriages that occur in that situation. Right. Or, or, or uh, infants b- born with uh, respiratory or coronary or even intellectual defects. Right. Is that subtle you're talking, poisoning? You're talking about natural gas and propane uh, cooking appliances. Yeah, a- any right. combustible fuel that's uh, vented inside that unit. Yep, you need to have fresh air, no doubt about it. Yeah, so in fact, what's really sad, a lot of times people will have a vent or hood over their stove, and instead of it pushing the air outside, it will actually just cycle it through through a filter and push it right back into the same area that you're living in. That's so right. Unless Thank that, you very much. Right. Right. In fact, my sister-in-law went through an experience where she, she had a vent or hood over her. Yeah. What do you call it? A hood? Right. A hood fan over her stove. Right. She didn't, didn't realize it wasn't pushing it outside, so she was literally breathing that air. And after a couple of hours of cooking, she was ending up with a headache and nausea. Didn't know why until I came over and, you know, used my equipment to tell her that there was a buildup of carbon monoxide and formaldehyde gases right there. So to all you preppers out there, please be aware if you're using a manufactured or mobile home, you need to go to gassingamerica.com, and then you, when you understand the issue, of course, you can remedy it. But if you don't know there's a problem, it'll injure you, or even kill you. In fact, we just had another death oh, about uh, 10 miles away from me. A man was found dead in his trailer from that very problem. That's so sad and so unnecessary. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, very Thank preventable. You. Very easily preventable. Yeah, and most people don't know that every single manufactured mobile home in America since 1976 violates ventilation code. You know, thank you, federal government. <laughs> Right, right. Well, it's good information. We're glad to get that out there, Tom. Anything else this morning? No, I appreciate your program. Um, but when, as soon as you can, I know you're busy, but as soon as you can, just review that. Right at the top of that web page, there's a little, uh, about a two, three-minute, what do you call it, PowerPoint uh, slideshow. If you watch that, you get it right right away in about uh, you know two minutes. Okay, sounds good. Tom, the hardcore the stuff is da- yeah. Okay. The hardcore stuff is down inside there, but if you just open up and uh, see that little slide show at the top, you'll understand it, and you can remedy it with just a garbage bag. Believe it or not, outstanding. Outstanding. That's great. Thank you for the call. All right. Thank you, John. It. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Call number is eight hundred three one three nine four four three. People that come here from other parts of the country to uh, Missouri, they're shocked to find out that there's no building codes. Once you're outside the city limits of these incorporated areas, uh, there's no building codes in the county itself. 113 counties in Missouri. And the majority of them are third-class counties that have no building codes. So you can build anything you want, uh, any way you want to, with no inspections, no permits. Which, if you know what you're doing or have a contractor that knows what they're doing, that, that's 
that works out pretty good. It saves time and money on one hand. On the other, if you don't know what you're doing or you have a contractor that doesn't know what they're doing or is cutting corners, you can end up with uh, a big mess on your hands. And I've seen examples of both. Extremely well-built homes that anybody would be very happy to and pleased to own and live in and homes that are absolute disasters in terms of uh, poor engineering, poor design, being built without blueprints, and so forth. Um, so it, it can go either way. But we have freedom here. We do have freedom in Missouri. You can build any – once you're away from these cities in Missouri and unincorporated Missouri – you can build anything you want, any way you want, and with no, with no permits and no inspections and no building codes. Um, I'm not against building codes, by the way. Uh, they, they do serve a good purpose, and for the most part, they make sense. Sometimes they don't, but usually they make sense and they're a good thing. And I, I do support building to code uh, just as much as possible. All right. Um, motor vehicles. Having a motor vehicle that operates when the grid's down, especially the first three days or so, could literally be a matter of life and death. Literally, if you have, if you're in an urban area, you need to get to to your retreat, your safe haven, and at some distance, not not walking distance under normal circumstances, that motor vehicle properly fueled up with in good running condition uh, could literally be a lifesaver and it's something you really need to look into really something you really need to look into and consider that if that's something that would fit your situation if it is then go ahead and do it bite the bullet get that 1972 Ford or the 1965 Chevrolet or 1970, uh, 1970 Dodge, whatever it is, it fits your needs and your budget. Uh, I would avoid the uh, show cars and show trucks. You're going to pay a premium price for expensive paint job and detailing that really serves no useful purpose. They were very attractive and very nice, but... Um, I would stay away from that market. There's a lot out there, a lot of uh, very elegant <laughs> and beautiful uh, antique cars and trucks. But you don't need that to, to accomplish your goal, just so it's serviceable and uh, in good condition. Uh, a beautiful paint job won't make it run any better, I guarantee it. It will not make it run any better at all. A little bit of rust here and there, uh, a faded paint, no problem. Here's our break. Call number is Jim, we're back. J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 29th of November. If you do decide to go ahead and get that um, pre-electronic car or truck, uh, well, there's a couple of ways you could look at it. One is to just keep it held in reserve for use only in emergencies. The other is to use it uh, occasionally for um, uh, travel or for hauling things if it's a truck. Uh, be sure you you, you, if you're not using it on a regular basis, that the uh, that the fuel has preservative put in it, that's really really important. That the battery remains in good condition. Uh, so there's a uh, battery tenders that you can get for well, they're, they're very expensive, to ten or twelve bucks that you can keep hooked up to puts a what's called a trickle charge into the battery, so that battery is always um, 
topped off and ready for action, whether it's 100 degrees or zero degrees. Um, usual things that go into maintenance of a vehicle, the vehicles need to be maintained. They need to be driven. It's not good for a vehicle, any motor vehicle, whether it's an antique or a new one, to just sit and not be used. It's not good for them at all. You know, I like Amsoil uh, products. I'm an Amsoil dealer. No apologies there. All my motor vehicles have Amsoil in them, and I uh, I get a lot of life out of them. My Lincoln Town Car now has 366,000 miles on it, all Amsoil products top to bottom. Uh, my motorcycle, I get the Amsoil in there, get it changed once a year. Whether it needs it or not, uh, once a year is a good a good uh, time to change the Amsoil on the motorcycle. And I actually save money. I do. I actually save money with the Amsoil products because I, I I change my oil far less often than anybody else who's doing it w- with regular petroleum products. Uh, so it costs a lot more up front on one hand. On the other, uh, the cost savings come from superior lubrication and, of course, uh, less far less frequent oil changes, 25,000 miles. So it's pretty neat to be able to do that and get better performance, better gas mileage, have the engine last longer, and save money at the same time. It's a win-win situation with the Amsoil products. They're there at my website. Um, also, of course, my website are John's Survival and Tactical Gear. We need to update them, but if you're looking at gifts for yourself or uh, other people, uh, you may find some things there you don't know even exist under John's survival and tactical gear. Um, can be a lot of fun uh, just going through that list and seeing the things that are there. Uh, Tim Spencer and I do need to update it. Many of those items are Amazon items that need to be relisted. Um, but uh, it's on the list, and hopefully we'll be able to take care of that in the not-too-distant future. Uh, tomorrow we should have Tim Spencer with us, uh, I hope, uh, Tom Berryhill. We may or may not have Don Kubley. He's over in, I believe, in either India or Bangladesh or both, uh, doing his projects. Friday, we should have Dr. Phil with us and Tom Berryhill talking about um, emergency communications. That's always a fun hour. And uh, that's it for the day. Get medical supplies, your energy cleaning, your essential oils. Now while you can, your firearms ammunition. Never, ever give up your guns. Have a fun, safe, productive day. And God bless America. 